And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Okay, so here's something significant here then. The Antichrist, one of his heads over here is wounded to death. So one of these heads get wounded over here. Now, if we're going to take it, take this point over here about his heads as it was wounded to death, I want us to see the interpretation within a figurative standpoint as well as a literal standpoint. Okay, so verses 1 through 3, let's summarize literal and figurative. So we already saw some of the figurative interpretations of 1, 2, and 3, right? The figurative was mentioned as these powers over here. We already saw that. It's rep symbolically representing all these powers over here. And he's coming from the Mediterranean region. If we're going to take it literally, this beast could somehow be near the uh, underworld and traveling from the underworld comes up out of the sea and that's where your pastor talked about some interesting thing of demonic activity below the sea, right? Because it's close to the location of hell. So that could be more literally than we think. And then another literal interpretation is at verse 3 here where literally his head gets wounded. So the Antichrist actually gets shot or cut with a knife or whatever. And then what happens is that his, it injures his right eye and then one of his arms. So I've explained that one in Revelation chat, during our commentary on Revelation 11. But we're going to go to this passage a few times. So let's go to Zechariah. Let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah. And then let's look at who this Antichrist is referred to at chapter 11. Chapter 11. The Pope is known to be the shepherd of the flock, so to speak, to the Roman Catholic Church. And the Antichrist is known as the shepherd of the flock. But notice that the shepherd of the flock is a false one, just like the Pope would. Now look at this one. How does the Antichrist get injured? Verse 17, Zechariah 11, verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So that's where the Antichrist gets injured. That's why literally his head gets injured. All right, let's go back to our main text. Now, but let's look at figuratively. Verse 3. If we're going to take this symbolically and figuratively, Remember, it says one of his heads, right? Remember, there are seven heads. These are seven powers, right? So then that means that one of the heads here get injured. Which head over here gets lost and injured? To be honest, I don't know, but I'll give you two interesting points. Dr. Upman says that he, he, he's betting on Alexander, but he's not sure, he says. I don't know why it would connect to Alexander. He just simply said that. That's it. So I'm like, can you, can you explain more? But he doesn't really explain. But I noticed that he's uh, reading with Daniel compared to Revelation with this. And I'll tell you what, Daniel, when you look at Daniel chapter 7, that coincides with Revelation 13. Amen. And Daniel talks about what? This he goat, Alexander the Great, that comes out. And the, he is also known as King of Grisha, Prince of Grisha. But guess what? Who is called King of Grisha? The Antichrist. If you don't believe me, let's go to Daniel. Daniel. All right, we're going to go past chapter 7. Then we're going to look at chapter 8. All right, we're going to look at Daniel, chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 21, verse 21. Look at this. So speaking of Alexander the Great, but it transitions from Alexander to the Antichrist. That's why I mentioned to you before, Alexander is a great type of the Antichrist, so he definitely qualifies as one of the seven heads. So take a look at this. So uh, verse... 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grisha, 
And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So this is talking about Alexander the Great, where he conquers Media and Persia at verse 20. Okay? Now, look how it talks about Alexander the Great, but later on the language does not sound like Alexander the Great. It's like switching to the future time period of the Antichrist. Keep reading. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. That's historically proven true. Alexander's empire was divided into four different kingdoms. One of them was Syria. And if you compare that with Daniel 11, that's where the Antichrist comes out, that Syrian line. But it's very interesting. Okay, so uh, let me make this simple as I can. Okay, it mentions the he-goat, right? So when this he-goat comes out, it has one horn. But then, which is Alexander the Great, so Greece, right? But then from here, it divides and sprouts out into four. One of them is Syria, which is the Antichrist. Wait a minute. So then when you look at this drawing, the Antichrist root is not just from Syria, it's from what? Greece. Keep reading. But not in his power, verse 22. Verse 23, and in what? The latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Look at that. That's like Antichrist language here. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Ah, remember the Antichrist attacks the Jewish people, the holy people? See, this is all matching up. Uh, through his policy also he shall cause Karaf to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart. Well, that definitely sounds like the Antichrist at Daniel 11, magnifying himself. Revelation 13, the Antichrist being worshipped. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the what? See, he's trying to go against God. So this is clearly the Antichrist then. So notice right here, so this is why it could possibly refer to this one, okay, figuratively. The other one that it could refer to is that it could be Rome. It could be Rome in here. You might say, why is that? Because Rome continues its power all the way throughout the tribulation timeline. So that's why your pastor is open to the possibility that it could be Rome in here. Because this makes a lot of sense. Rome is the only power that uh, continued from one of the seven heads all the way to today, all the way to the tribulation. Now, uh, you're going to see this continuation, which your pastor showed you before. I'm not going to really show you, but it, uh, I showed it to you last time when I talked about the seven head and ten horn antichrist. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 shows you that undoubtedly Paul was speaking about the Roman emperor being that Antichrist type, but not the official Antichrist. And then when he talks about the official Antichrist, he's following that same context about the Roman Emperor, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The, he mentions the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked, the Antichrist, be revealed. See, so this Antichrist is following a Roman setup. And if you look at Revelation 17, undoubtedly the Roman Catholic Church is a power play for the Antichrist. Not only that, we saw how the Antichrist is likely to be a pope. See, Roman Catholic pope. So this is why he can transition to that one. So that's also possible. All right, either way, let's jump to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Whether Rome or Greece, it's all the same hell, it doesn't matter. All right, Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Okay, for sensitive people online, I'm not trashing your country. If you're from Greece or if you're from Rome, Italy, okay? I'm just saying that just in case some people are sensitive about it. Okay, let's go back to Revelation 13, verse 3. So then, one of the heads wounded to death, and notice what? His deadly wound was healed. Look at the wording at verse 3. Wounded to what? Death. And his what? Deadly wound was healed. So this guy practically died, so to speak. 
So if one of these head is Roman, then we could say this, the Roman Catholic Pope died, and then what? He healed himself. So he, re he resuscitated, he resurrected. He revived. So notice it died and revived here. Notice certain languages too. We've already uh, shown this at a few verses before, but let's look at it again. Review. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when the, they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that, what? Ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. He comes out of the bottomless pit. Why? Because he went down there. Look at Revelation 17. Revelation 17. Revelation 17. Verse 11. Notice he went down to hell. Revelation 17, verse 11. And the beast that was and is not. So notice right here, he existed, was, and is not. He didn't exist. See, that seems to match up with what? He's alive and then he died. But keep reading. Even he is the eight. See? Then he's back up again. Like he's revived or resurrected. And is of the seven and what? Wait a minute. How do you go into perdition and then ascend out of perdition. Unless what, but he originally came from the sea, it said, right? So unless you say it this way, unless you say he did come out of the sea and then he died, went down to the pit, and then when he resurrected, he came up out of the pit. See that? Uh, let's look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. So there's no doubt that he did die and then he resurrected. Look at Revelation 13, 14. 13, 14. The last part of the verse says, The beast which had the wound by a sword and what? Did live. See that? So it's like he revived. He overcame it. So there's no doubt from the wording of Revelation 13 about dead and like a revived system. And we looked at Revelation 11 and 17 that he did exist and then went to perdition, came up out of perdition. This, but he originally came from the sea, this would all make sense. So again, review, originally came up out of the sea, matching with Daniel chapter 11, that he's from the Syrian Jewish region originally. But then somebody assassinated him. So then he died, deadly wound, wound by a sword, did live. So then he went down to the pit, goeth into perdition, Revelation 17. The verse says, beast was, he was originally alive, and is not. He didn't exist, so he died. Even he is the eight, so he came back up again. Revelation 13 says, did live. And then Revelation 11, he ascended out of the pit. Okay, so this makes a lot of sense. We follow so far? All righty. If you don't, then rewind the video, and then look at the verses, and then see how that matches up, okay? Okay. All right, Revelation chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 3. And all the world wondered after the beast. Yeah, they were wondering. They were wondering, wow, this guy survived. So why would they wonder after the beast unless he died and resurrected, right? It's one thing like uh, getting shot and surviving it, but it's another thing where you actually died and resurrected. The verse says, all the world wondered after the beast. Now remember Revelation chapter 6, we mentioned this before at the first seal, that the Antichrist of Revelation 6 verse 2, he went forth conquering and to conquer. So you'll notice over there he was trying to conquer the nations. There were some rogue nations, right? If you look at the second seal, there was war that broke out. But here at Revelation 13, it's different. At Revelation 13, what? All the world this time wonder after the beast. He got, he won their hearts this time. Why? He proved himself to be God. That's something. If Satan wants to imitate Jesus Christ, how you can imitate this is that you get buried three days and three nights. Jesus went to the heart of the earth, right? 
Satan is going to go to the heart of the earth too. Satan incarnate, the Antichrist. And then come up out of the pit, boom. Yeah, resurrect him, just like Jesus. And everyone's going to say, this is definitely Jesus Christ. Let's worship him. That's what's going to happen. Another thing is this, is that this seems to show then that the tribulation timeline, that if we put it to three and a half, there's a teaching out there that the tribulation is three and a half years. That could be true. But um, one of the things is it seems like the time is too cramped here. The reason why is because at verse 3, it shows over here the world wandered after the beast. But then in Revelation 6, it shows that there was war going out and he was conquering and to conquer. Not only that, the beast, he was alive before, but now at Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, he resurrects. So there has to be some kind of time before that. See that? So that's why... Um, uh, i prone to go more of a traditional route seven years, but uh, I could be wrong about that too. I've heard many, I've heard different theories. Th uh, three and a half, seven, ten and a half. I've heard 14 and 14 and a half before, and then uh, 40. And then God knows how, other, how many other years, you know. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so, but this shows right over here that maybe three and a half might be too short. Maybe. But let's keep reading over here. Verse 4, and they worship the dragon. Can you, did you read that correctly? They worship the dragon. They worship Satan. The whole world will worship Satan. That's shocking to you, but it will happen. Why? Which gave power unto the beast. Because it's through this beast. See, this beast, how does he come out as? Well, let's return to our main text at verse 2 which I neglected. Let's go back to verse 2. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, right? All right, so this leopard over here, what would it represent? It would represent an integrated country. How so? Because it's combining this country and then it's combining this country. Lion, bear, and then it's combining this, leopard. Now compare that with Daniel 7. Go to Daniel 7. Now I mentioned this to you last time in our teaching of the seven-headed dragon, but let's briefly review, okay? Let's look at Daniel chapter 7. There is no doubt, if you want to book, make a bookmark, Daniel 7 goes hand in hand with Revelation 13. You're going to see a lot of clues there. Daniel 9 goes hand in hand with Matthew 24. You, you, so these are two keys that I would like to give to you. If you do that, it's going to be very eye-opening when you open up uh, the scriptures about end times prophecy. Okay, let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea. Wait a minute, that same thing like Revelation 13, a beast comes from the sea. See, it's the same thing. But let's keep reading. Diverse one from another. These are all different beasts. The first was like a what? Lion. Okay. Now, all Bible scholars agree this is representing a kingdom and a country. Okay? A kingdom and a country. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Let's look at the next country and kingdom. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. So we see so far this one country, lion, see that? One country, bear. This Antichrist is an integrated country, see that? Integrated with the beliefs of different countries. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 6, after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard. See, another country. Ah, but look at verse 7. This is verse 7. Revelation 13, 1. This is the beast. John and Daniel saw together. Ready? After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. Well, that sounds a lot like the Antichrist beast at Revelation 13, 1. Someone very great. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. So notice right here, it had a strong mouth and a powerful feet. If you had a mouth like a lion that can do that, 
and a feet of a bear, you can do wonders. Whoop! Wait a minute. Revelation 13, right? Oh! But let's keep reading. And it was what? Diver Look at carefully at the wording of your King James Bible. Diverse from all the beasts that were before it. It just, some people just gloss through that simply saying, oh, it's just different from all the other beasts. No, no, there's something more careful to that. Diverse is the key word as well as what? All the beasts that were before it. See, all the beasts that were before it, and it was diverse. See that? Let me point that out at the picture. It had all the beasts before it, and it was diverse. What does that mean? That means this beast is undoubtedly Revelation 13.1. This leopard that comes out with feet of a bear, mouth of a lion. Make sense? There is no doubt that's the same creature. Comes from the sea at verse 3 as well. And then the bear, the lion, the leopard, they're countries. We already saw that. If this is coming out in the future, during modern times, we have to compare the we have to see which countries would most likely fit modern countries for the end times that would match up with this beast. What are they? Your pastor told you this before. It would be England would be the lion, the bear would be Russia, and leopard would be America. Why? Well, I explained it at our seven-headed dragon video, so let me just make this very quick. So remember, it says mouth of a lion. What's, the, what's pretty much the world's language, a universal language that even foreign countries learn in schools? It's English. So you see England. Not only that, Daniel chapter 7 showed this lion had wings. And then if you look at uh, one of the uh, England's arm symbols, it shows that griffin. And then one of Russia's symbol is actually the bear, believe it or not. But when Russia was conquering the world, and Daniel 7 says... Uh, the bear was walking, it was rising up on its two feet to conquer and devour. Russia said that it, a bear that walks like a man, so to speak. It's kind of that kind of phrase, when they were conquering the world. So it matches up with that one. Uh, also, America, why would America be the leopard? Very simple, because notice the Antichrist's main body is a leopard. And a leopard has the three racial colors of all different races. A white belly, a yellow skin, and black spots. Sociology 101 used to teach that that would be mongoloid, negroid, and caucasian. So notice right here, not only that, America, if you look at all the other countries in the world, it is a country with English as its main language, and the way that it's moving and conquering the world is like a communist type of country. There is, so this is no doubt, this is no doubt, the match. Some people who ignorantly say Russia is not communist, <laughs> no, no, okay. I don't care what, I don't care if, if it's officially not known as a communist country. Look, you look at the government, you look at the setup, and I have some members who actually lived in Russia and came over here. They know that pretty much is communist if you're going to be plainly honest about it.